The point is that these events, they didn't end in the past, right? The issue is that these events that happened centuries ago, decades ago, continue to live on today, like their impacts continue to be felt. Today on Chalk Radio, we're exploring transitional and reparative justice and how seeking expertise from everywhere might lead to better understanding. The process of reparative justice is about, well, how do we address that? How do we address what is today? And how do we seek justice for what's happened in the past as a means towards addressing these challenges today and being able to move forward from them, being able to move on to something else? I'm your host, Sarah Hansen. My guest today is Professor Ama Edo, an assistant professor of anthropology and African studies at MIT. You may remember Ama from her episode on Chalk Radio back in season one. We're sitting down with her again, this time to discuss her course called Reparations for Slavery and Colonization, Contemporary Movements for Justice. The inspiration for the course came, in part, from the Black Lives Matter protests that took place around the world in 2020. What was expressed during these protests, whether in the U.S. or in Europe, where I have a lot of friends and collaborators, and so I was kind of hearing echoes from both sides of the Atlantic, was kind of a framing of contemporary racial injustice, racial discrimination, racism, as a legacy of slavery and colonialism, right? And so thinking about police violence, but also thinking about housing discrimination and also thinking about the collections that are held in European or American museums, thinking about so many aspects of our lives today and recognizing that so many of the disparities and the injustices that were brought to the surface through these protests, right, and that we're surrounded by at all times, have a historical origin. This is what was so powerful in these protests around the world was that they were saying there's no dealing with what we recognize as a problem today without dealing or talking about what happened in the past, right? And so this class was meant to take that seriously and to say, well, how, what are the models for that? Because reparations has been and continues to be an incendiary topic, right? It's still seen as somewhat controversial. And I think part of that stems from partial understanding about what is meant by reparations and kind of a knee-jerk reaction to, to the idea of what reparations is. If you've been on any social media site recently, Alma's statement likely feels true to you. There do seem to be strong reactions to the idea of what reparations are. I asked Alma how she defines or conceptualizes reparations. It's about establishing the record, the historical record, or redressing the historical record so that the harms that have been done can be named. And then thinking about, well, what does what my justice look like? This one thing to learn from events that have happened in the past. It's another to try to learn from what's happening in the moment and put that in conversation, of course, with what's happened in the past, but to to document, to learn and interrogate what's happening as it's happening was super exciting. And it, the prospect of engaging students in that process, to me, was really, really powerful as an instructor. Amma's interest in justice and anthropology is something that stems from her past, She shared how growing up across Western and Southern Africa and the United States shaped her understanding of what it means to be Black and African in the world. So I was born in the U.S. My parents were in graduate school in the U.S. from Togo, and so I had an American passport from birth. And I was the only one in my family to have an American passport. And among my friends, you know, we're in Togo. And I remember, you know, as young as, I don't know, five or six, feeling that having this American passport was really special and that somehow it made me better, quote unquote. It doesn't feel great to admit that, but that's the truth of it. I, I felt like somehow it's special because I had this American passport. Why does a six-year-old have that kind of consciousness, right? Like, where does that come from? There was always a sense that real life happened elsewhere, that real life was happening in the U.S., that real life was happening in Europe and all these other places. And the goal and that the idea was always to leave. You know, and then race comes into it when I started paying attention to skin bleaching or even this hair straightening. These were things that I was noticing in my environment, whether in Togo it was Congolese music videos. We we listened to a lot of music from the Congo at the time. And so you'd, I'd start noticing, or there was a moment where you'd start noticing men and women who bleach their skin. And so you could see the signs and then this question about why, why is that a thing? And then after college, I was in Zambia for a few years. And I remember one day I tried to actually make an experiment of it. And I was on the minibus and I was looking out the window and I was like, let me count how many women that I see 
actually skin bleach or have evidence of skin bleaching. And it was three out of four, you know, just during this little ride. So, you know, this question about what does lighter skin mean? Why do people put themselves through this, um, given, you know, the health effects and so on? Questions about skin color, about race, about um, one's place in the world. All of these things are part of, for me, the question of Africanness in the world. Ama understands that students, too, bring their personal histories into the classroom. She tries to create a space for sharing perspectives and honoring individual experiences. And when discussing concepts like reparations, it becomes all the more important to do this. I think it's really about opening up space for for sharing, for conversation, and honoring all the participants' contributions, right? And showing that we're, we're building this thing together as we go and learning together. One thing that's evolved for me over the course of the semester even was just trying to shift from talking about reparations to talking about reparative justice. I think there are associations that are made with the word reparations and that can prompt knee-jerk reactions. I think that emphasizing the justice side of it and the processual side of it by saying reparative justice opens up a little bit of space. But reparations or reparative justice, I think, can be or should be part of a transitional justice mechanism, which is really just meant to address widespread or large-scale human rights violations. Reparative justice might be one of the many things that go into seeking justice for abuses or violations that happen at a large scale where you can't deal with the harms that were done to people individually. While material compensation is one of the most common examples of reparations, Ama explained that reparative justice isn't just limited to that. Things such as amending our historical records and honoring the people who've been disenfranchised by colonization and racial inequity are just as important. You can have material reparations in the form of money or land or other forms of resources, um, and then also symbolic reparations that are part of, ideally, part of a healing process, a, a process of acknowledging that these harms were made, that they had significant impacts, and that moving forward requires actually addressing what's happened in the past. Because oftentimes this is a critique that's brought forward. Well, why do you want to reopen old wounds? This is just going to stoke tension. It's going to stoke conflict. This is only going, you know, it's just it happened a long time ago. People today are not responsible for what was done centuries ago, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is that these events didn't end in the past, right? The issue is that these events that happened centuries ago, decades ago, continue to live on today. Like their impacts continue to be felt, whether it's at the level of individual bodies or if it's at the level of societies or in the landscape, in the literal land, right? The legacies of colonialism in various parts of the world is held in the actual land, is, are held in people's bodies physically, psychologically, not to mention the structural disadvantage that the descendants of, of enslaved people or formerly colonized people continue to face. So these issues are not past. There's nothing that's past about them. They're very much so in the present tense. And so the process of reparative justice is about, well, how do we address that? How do we address what is today? And how do we seek justice for what's happened in the past as a means towards addressing these challenges today and being able to move forward from them, being able to move on to something else? That's where the transitional justice angle or kind of frame comes in or the language, let's say, right? Like if we think about this as a transition towards something better, reparative justice needs to be part of that. One of the main assignments students work on in the course is creating a case study documenting what it takes to work towards reparative justice and what challenges arise along the way. By compiling these studies, Ama is building up an archive within her lab, the African Futures Action Lab, which she co-founded with her colleague Lilian Omubiei. The goal of the lab is to support unfolding movements for reparative justice across Europe, Africa, and the Americas. Ama's course seeks to combine the expertise of different activist groups, one from Algeria and one in Belgium, with those of guest speakers by bringing them together for discussions. These dialogues are shared in the classroom, where students can discuss them and apply them to their case studies. Essentially, the model for the class comes from the AFA lab, the African Futures Action Lab, 
kind of what's at the core of our mission, which is to bring together different or to connect different forms of expertise around these questions, right? Recognizing that you have all these people who hold a lot of knowledge and expertise relevant to these struggles for justice and for racial justice and reparative justice, but who are not necessarily in conversation with one another. So how do we facilitate these exchanges, right? And so bringing that in conversation with the classroom and saying, how can we not only bring these different folks in conversation with one another, but how can we have that be part of the learning experience? experience for students. In the case of the Algeria group, it was made up of three scholars and activists who are Algerian. They approached us because they were interested in exploring what had been done, the kinds of claims that had been brought against the French state for colonial violence broadly, and then specifically also for nuclear tests that were conducted in Algeria in the Sahara after independence. The second group was already organized as a civil society organization. So it was a, a collective of Afro-descended Belgian people that was formed in response to a commission that was set up by the Belgian state this summer to examine Belgium's colonial past in the Congo, Burundi, and Rwanda. One of the speakers that we brought in was Anna Moyo Kupeta, who is the executive director of the Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation in South Africa. And she's a transitional justice expert and a lawyer and longtime activist. She came in to speak with the Belgian group in particular about how civil society can hold accountable the state commission, right? The role that civil society can play in transitional justice processes. And it was a super interesting conversation, a bit intimidating, I think, in the sense that she really laid out to us how this is work that unfolds over the course of years, right? Like the, the kind of the lobbying and the advocacy work and the sentinel work that civil society organizations have to do to hold state entities accountable. And so it made it really concrete for the group that could then say, OK, what are we able to do given the time and the resources that we have? It was really important for us to have, throughout this process, to have voices that are coming from different directions. So to have an expert from South Africa inform the process in Belgium, for instance, was really important to us, right? Because, again, you know, it was just thinking about the many layers of intervention that this course or, this, or the work that we're doing with the lab is meant to do, to accomplish. It's also to highlight the fact that expertise resides everywhere. And it's not just a north-south kind of direction for the transfer of knowledge information, but it, you know, south, 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 north, all of it. Expertise resides everywhere. That's a powerful idea. And it's one that shaped how Ahmed designed the course. As part of the course, she shared guest speakers' videos on the MIT OpenCourseWare YouTube channel. She invited learners from around the world to share their expertise, questions, and perspectives in the comments. The idea was that these comments could then be brought back into the classroom, and then we could, in the classroom, engage them and sort of be in conversation with those comments, and then that I could then bring it back. How did it actually unfold? So there were a lot of comments that, that felt like knee-jerk reactions to reparations being in the title rather than the actual content of the videos. That was different from what we had envisioned. And so I think we had less material to work with in terms of the comments of the videos that could be brought into the classroom than what we had imagined. But still, it was very interesting and generative to bring back the comments that we did get into the classroom. We had um, some really nice discussions with students because it reminded us again that these issues that we're dealing with in the class are unfolding live. Ama later explained to me that in hindsight, it might have been helpful to provide more connective tissue for the YouTube audience. After all, students attending the MIT class had access to readings and other course materials to provide context and to frame the discussion around reparations. YouTube learners didn't have those materials. To fix that, Ama is currently working on sharing all of her teaching materials from the course on our MIT OpenCourseWare website. I found Ama's reflections interesting, so I asked her to share three tips for other educators who might want to try opening their classrooms through public forums. I think having some degree of awareness of how your topic is seen or will land or kind of what it means out in the world. But sort of remembering kind of what does this mean to people outside of that setting, right? Because that has implications for the kinds of comments that you might get and therefore how you might frame, you know, how you share, what you share, how you respond and so on. Having a great team, I think it's, I think it's, it's absolutely a team effort. 
I think working with folks who are again, back to the question of expertise, right, who are coming in with knowledge that we can't have all the knowledge in of ourselves. So you all brought in knowledge about these educational platforms that open up onto the world and what it takes to make that possible technically and also in terms of the, the nature of the engagement, right, what we can expect, how to plan for that and all that and all of it. Really um, having it be a team effort and taking stock ahead of time of the range of expertise that's needed to do this, both technically, content-wise and, and conceptually. And then the third tip I think it's not to be afraid to like to experiment. I think, you know, we at the a few months ago we were just like, oh God, how's this gonna work out, right? Like we we had the sense. I think we all felt that this was a good idea, and I still think it's a good idea. And I really, I really hope to see it like in the full blown version of kind of the vision because I, I really still believe in the idea. I still believe in the model. I'm grateful to you all for your willingness also to experiment. And I think that that's something that we were all like, all right, let's just try it. Let's just try it and let's see what works. And I think we really did manage to. Nothing went massively wrong, you know, and actually, and I think some things actually went, a lot actually went right. And I certainly learned a lot from it. And I, and, you know, seeing what my students produced at the end of it, I think they got a lot from it. The activists at the end were very grateful and like also inspired by the process. So I think it was a success in many ways. So I think being willing to, to take risks and to experiment and to recognize that it's not going to be perfect at the first pass. This is part of learning, right? It's about making mistakes and figuring it out as you go so you can do it better next time. This is a philosophy that Ama is truly living out. She shared some things she hopes to learn from other educators to improve how teaching and learning unfold in her classroom. I would love to learn more about how folks talk about a topic that's considered controversial and incendiary in a way that draws people in, that both does justice to the seriousness of it, right? And that's kind of uncompromising in the sense, in terms of, you know, its sense of what needs to be done and the importance of it without being alienating, right? How do you draw folks in without compromising on the reality or kind of your sense of why this matters and what it is? How do you draw people in without compromising on that? And then Relatedly, we can underestimate the challenges of talking or interacting across areas of practice and disciplines and, and, and expertise. Like we don't we don't speak the same language, we don't think in the same terms. And so how folks have navigated that, because building relationships takes time. So how do you foster a space where folks can interact meaningfully when they don't have very much time to spend together? This idea of bringing people from different practices and disciplines together to find expertise everywhere is part of what makes Professor Edo's course so valuable. It creates a wealth of perspectives that are actively reshaping how we view the conversation on race, justice, and equity around the globe. If you're interested in adding your expertise or to learn from others, you can find AMA's videos on our MIT OpenCourseWare YouTube site. You'll soon find her teaching materials on our MIT OpenCourseWare website as well. You can find Amma's lab online at www.africanfutures.mit.edu. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, signing off from Cambridge, Massachusetts, I'm your host, Sarah Hansen, from MIT OpenCourseWare. Chalk Radio's producers include myself, Brett Pachi, and Dave Lashansky. Our script writers are Nidhi Shastri and Aubrey Calloway. Show notes for this episode were written by Peter Chipman. And Ama Edo's course materials are shared on our OCW website by Reese Jenkins. We're funded by MIT Open Learning and supporters like you.